Or Hello, Natalie Haynes. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you. It's nice to see you too. <laughs> Look so, at you all dressed up nice. I know, I'm ready for you. So I Natalie. Really do, although my idea of dressing up nice is Charlie Brown t shirt, but that still counts. We each have our own way. Yes, right. we do. <laughs> Okay, so, so your book, A Thousand Shifts, begins with Calliope, the muse, getting a bit bored by the poet invoking her for inspiration. That's Sing, true. muse, he says, and the edge of his voice makes it clear it's not a request. So is that how it feels to be a fiction writer? Yeah, sometimes, a bit. Yeah, sometimes. Not very often. Generally, I'm really happy to um, make things and to write and to create but there are times where and it is it's definitely a compliment when people say oh can you do this have you written that will you do this and they're like oh that's really nice and sometimes you want to go I'm going as fast as I can I'm really tired <laughs> I haven't had a day off in years please stop asking me and so I try and remember that generally when people are asking they're not being that guy um they're being uh you know they want you to know that they like your work and they're enthusiastic about it um, and so generally when people go, oh, can you do another radio series? You go, yeah, we literally just did one. I'm going to sit. I just need to finish this book. And then I said, but you know that I have everything lined up like, you know, what's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? The whole time. So, yeah, sometimes it feels a bit like that. A little bit. Yeah. Little so, bit. <laughs> is that why you've been described as the nation's great moose? Because it literally does make you feel that way. <laughs> yeah I think so that must be it yeah it's the overwork that's what <laughs> muses just don't get enough said about them it's the overwork that's the problem I think it's nice because it gets it allows us to sort of reclaim the word muse because for such a long time it's it's meant you know in the modern world it's meant essentially pretty lady who makes man able to create art uh, which I at least have a problem with as a description because the muses are goddesses you know they're the reason that any of us can create art, if you're going to believe in a system of gods, I have no problem with believing in muses over any other kind, although I'm not a massive believer, as you know. Um, and so the idea for me that, um, that muses are sort of essentially silent, beautiful women who allow men to create just seems nonsensical. That's obviously not what they are in Greek myth. And so I felt like it was a, a nice, you know, there are lots of women that I felt like I could reclaim in A Thousand Ships. And uh, the muse is no less than any. It's like, respect them, dude. They're working hard for you. And do you really get a sense of that? It must have been a really lovely moment when you thought you could reclaim the muse in that way. Yeah, I mean, I only ever intended her to be the start and the end of the book. This was my editor who wanted the um, strand of Calliope to run through the book. She was absolutely right, of course. Um, and so I got to write kind of extra Calliopes towards, towards the end of the um creative process and it was really hard to just get to go and another thing the whole time <laughs> that is how I type I wish it wasn't but yeah because if there's ever a time that um we need authors to writing stories it's probably now so um we can't all be together as we normally are in uh, Salon London or Salon North uh, also um, festival and so uh, I wanted to um, just kind of do a bit of a re recap of your relationship to classics so people can get a bit of an understanding of you um, uh, Nat because uh, I can't read the room you can't read the room it they could all be rioting right now <laughs> enough of this shit come on Ooh, no more Greeks for us. We don't know. They could be just, it could all be kicking off right now. <laughs> Instant sound of breaking glass. No, I can't. It's fine. But so we're going to try and explain why classics are for everyone, which has been such a part of your um, career today. So yeah. you studied the classics at Cambridge, no surprise there. But um, one thing that people might not know that is that you were a stand-up for the decade. So much so that it's, it's not really mentioned now that you were a stand-up. Um, but you did do it. And did that give you a, a kind of great sense of not being a stranger to terrible things happening on stage? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose you're right. I don't really mention it anymore because... Um, 
I feel vaguely I have like survivor's guilt when it comes to stand up because like it's such a tough life it is a really is really difficult profession and be nice to your local comedian because they already had a long day just in general um and uh, especially be nice to them at the moment uh, because they've just lost a ton of work um but it's it's a brutal it's a brutal life or at least it can be getting um getting not liked by hundreds of people at a time that's really painful um and uh in the 90s when i was starting out uh it it was really rough <laughs> and so um i know that the radio series is called natalie haynes stands up for the classics and so um i can't pretend i i'm kind of i'm kind of playing it both ways i suppose i have survivor's guilt that other people still call me a stand up but i know i'm not one but at the same time i feel um when i turn up to do a gig now you know people have paid for a ticket with my name on it it's a much easier life than going and doing pubs and working men's clubs which was my life in the 90s and early noughties so yeah i feel um i have that that experience it's made me a much more confident performer i never i'm not afraid of anything that's going to happen to me on stage at a book festival i'll tell you that for nothing like, what's the worst that can happen the stage will catch fire the stage already caught fire when i was on tour with rob rouse decades ago so you know i'm not i'm not bothered by very much as a performer i'm much more worried about writing than i am performing that's true so yeah i feel i feel slightly guilty allowing people to call me a stand-up comedian so i tend not to do it i tend not to say you know in my and also i think it confuses people because they can't accept the kind of category shift so easily it took people a while when i was touring ancient guide which came out in 2010 it was okay because that was a non-fiction book and it was about the ancient world but it was sort of quite sometimes bits of it are funny and so people were like oh okay a sort of breezy fun non-fiction talk about a breezy fun non-fiction book but because my novels are really sad <laughs> i think people are like wait you're funny but the novel is sad yeah i don't know what to say to you yeah the talk will be fun the book will be sad that's just how it goes um so and that's been true for three books in a row now the next one of course is is non-fiction which will make it a bit easier for people again but yeah i think it it gives people a slight category error issue so i try and make it a bit simpler by not banging on about being a stand-up but i think there was a time although i've now forgotten when and where some somebody um edited it out of my bio for a, a book jacket somewhere and i was really like oh <laughs> it's like, you've just taken it away from me all those years yeah i was a comedian for the best part of 11 or 12 years it was a you know it was a big part of my life it was my first kind of proper job improper job um and uh and so yeah it's not it's not nothing that's my whole 20s and a, a chunk of my 30s that people are, are describing and they decide to miss it out as a big part of my life they're denying i suppose yeah and, and we really wanted to mention it comedy is a huge part of also and you know for reasons i hope we'll see i think it's a really interesting part of your uh your work you mentioned Ancient Guide to Modern Life, which came out in 2010, which is when we met you at Salon London. That's right. Um, All those and years ago. We yeah. did a gig somewhere I've forgotten in Mayfair, maybe. Yeah, you weren't on stage. You were writing a piece for the um, Independent, and I called your name, and you weren't there. Um, that does sound like me. Yeah, <laughs> you ran straight like on me. stage and started your set. I'd never seen anything like it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've never anyone so professional in my life. <laughs> we were so young then. <laughs> But it was yeah. Juliet, actually, Juliet um, Russell, the third member of Salon London. Um, it, she'd read the book and said, this, this woman is incredible. This is read, written so brilliant. What an oh. amazing way to bring um, classics to people. Was that your intention? Did you want... Always. 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 I always want people to know about classics because, it, as you know, it's a source of great sorrow to me that classics teaching, particularly language teaching, is so limited and i understand that the national curriculum is is heaving at the seams <coughs> with what people would like to be able to study um or feel that children need to learn students need to learn um, and so classics get sort of pushed to one side and the vast majority of classics teaching is in private schools um mm. and th that's not entirely true there are still some extremely impressive state schools who are teaching latin and greek as well as classical civilization um which is you know these these sort of histories and stories in translation for the most part so a society paper or a, a you know homer paper or whatever um and there's a lot more of that going on in state schools because there's a bit more time for it but it is really it's really been limited in the way that people can access it and it bothers me that what happens then is that people treat classics as though it's intrinsically elitist you know like mm. it's classics's fault 
but it's been limited to an elite. It's not. Plastics is completely neutral in this story. Um, but it bothers me a lot that we have a, a kind of that we've we've sort of slid into a world in which we kind of say people aren't good enough to learn this. And that's a that's a response that I had a lot when Ancient Guide came out. And for years later, I still sometimes get mail about it now, um, where people tell me that they were um, at school in the 60s or 70s um, and they failed their 11 plus because they weren't considered clever enough. And so they weren't allowed to study Latin. And so they sort of felt their whole lives that they failed Latin, you know, that they weren't good enough for it. And then, you know, they get to retire and this is finally a moment where they can open their minds and, and have the time to, to pursue s some classics of some sort. It's like plastics didn't, didn't decide that. Latin is a really relatively easy language to learn. It's certainly easier than, than French, which you, know, you had to learn when, when we were at school, it's compulsory. Um, it's easier than German. You never have to talk it, so it's all right if you're not very confident. And it kind of cracks my heart that people feel like they're not good enough for classics. Classics will wait for you for as long as you need it to. It's waited thousands of years. It's okay. And so I think the act of, of putting classics back into people's lives is, is something which, you know, I didn't realize. And I was interviewed by somebody a few years ago, I think for the Children of Jocasta, and he said I was a proselytizer um the classics and it was such a great religious term i would never have used it but as soon as he said it i realized he was right you know i want i want everyone to have access to this if they want it i don't think everyone should have to sit down and you know learn latin vocab all day every day i do um but <laughs> you do i i think everyone should have the option of being able to learn latin if they want to and it it cracks my heart that people feel like they're not allowed so oh. yeah any any option of putting classics into the world of saying right Here's a radio show about classics. Here's a novel with classics in it. Here's a non-fiction book about these books. Here you go. I, you know, I was so I've been so lucky. I got to study Latin from eleven. I got to study Greek from fourteen. I got to do triple classics A levels, which no one would let you do now because it makes you virtually, you know, so focused that you don't have any kind of breadth. Um, I got to do a classics degree. I've been incredibly lucky that classics has been in my life for so long. So yeah, I'm totally, totally going to let other people have access to it whenever I get the chance. It's my secret motivation at all times it is and you're incredibly passionate about it but you know for for general readership if, or for general public that has you know kind of suffered from the fact that that classics has become elitist generally you know why should they look back why should they look back to these stories from millennia ago when we've got netflix and you know <laughs> lots of other options for our entertainment why look backwards well, I suppose there's a lot to be said for there being things in your life that aren't entertaining um, as a kind of um, single motivating force. Um, I would argue that um, if you want to understand fully the narratives that you're watching in long form TV, those those narrative principles are established by Aristotle and his poetics. Um, and of course, therefore, you can watch cheerfully watch Peaky Blinders without having <laughs> uh, without seeing these um Greek story arcs, these Greek tragic story arcs, which are developed in the fifth century BCE and then kind of codified by Aristotle in the fourth century BCE. But I don't see why you, you wouldn't think that was interesting, I guess. Uh, I have no problem with you not wanting to read Aristotle. It's super dense, like lecture notes. Um, but it seems a shame not to know the kinds of things that he's talking about. Uh, so much of our philosophy, so much of our history, um, so much of our thought is predicated on the ancient world, yeah, our legal systems are predicated. It seems bonkers, but and of course, this is very um, uh, geographically specific. You know, it's it's really hard to know how to talk about it in a non-loaded way now. You know, for a long time, people said the West, and it's like, well, West of what? Um, <laughs> but you know, allowing for the fact that it's an extremely loaded and post-colonial term, the Western world owes owes everything to to the ancient Western world. So essentially. Um, the history of the Greeks and the history of the Romans. And, and we've taken a huge amount of that. We've taken a huge amount from things since then, um, even things that I'm not personally invested in, like the you know uh, Christian church, for example, has obviously had a huge development on the way we think and write. But it would be foolish to suggest that you could walk through, um, there are some amazing uh, remote gallery tours that you can go on, museum tours at the moment, where museums have opened their um, websites so that you can go on a little tour around them. 
And it would be foolish to suggest that you can understand everything that's happening in those oil paintings if you haven't read the Bible, because, you know, there are lots of biblical tales there. But it would be foolish to suggest you can understand them if you haven't read Ovid, because the Metamorphoses was such an inspirational text for so many painters. Now, there are all kinds of problems with reading Ovid. He is what we might now say problematic, because the Metamorphoses is essentially a, an epic poem or a, a almost kind of epic poem which is full of sexual violence, particularly against women, but not only against women. Um, and so it is a very troubling poem in some ways to read, but it's a masterpiece. And so I think for me anyway, the idea of trying to navigate our way around all art now without having those um, pieces of scaffolding kind of in place, it just seems to me you're depriving yourself of whole extra quantities of meaning. And it, it just, it kind of cracks my heart again. So it's when in people are talking about the ancient world being our sort of cultural foundation myths, which is big language. You know, it's, it's mm. a huge thing to, to understand if you haven't studied the classics. But this is what you're really talking about. Is that if you want to understand the way we live now, that is scaffolding, that it's really useful to understand it's because it's under us. It's such a big part of it. Yeah, it's such a big part of it. So you know it, it, it's okay to not know the story of creation that's in hesiod's theogony um <laughs> thanks but the idea of you know what's a good illustration um the idea that we don't want to know that from chaos comes for you know that's an incredible idea that chaos is a god um and from that you know the the world as we know it eventually is it's like well that, that's it's of course it's just myth but it's interesting it's you know taking us closer to different ways of looking at our uh foundational myths these are all interesting i think yeah it's really interesting and one of the things i hadn't really understood uh, until working with you was just how so little of it has survived and it's something oh, like yeah. one percent of the work that we have now is 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 what what we could have had we've got one percent of what we had could have had yeah between one and three percent yeah i mean the vast majority of things written in either Latin or Greek from the ancient world has been lost or was destroyed. Yeah, that's true. And also, you know, it's, and, and for, for lots of reasons, sometimes it's deliberately destroyed. Um, sometimes, you know, libraries are burned. Sometimes it just doesn't get copied. Um, you only have a limit, you know, scribes have only got, it's, it's not, it's not easy in days for printers. Scribes <laughs> have only got a limited number of hands between them. And so, you know, yes, they, they are more likely to reflect the taste and prejudice of, of their times and what they copy. So sometimes it just seems bonkers that we have a text that we do have. Juvenal is so shocking and, you know, extremely, let's say, racy and, and leave it there. <laughs> and yet, you know, monks found him very inspirational because he's very disapproving and he is certainly very disapproving and also very racy. Um, and so we have Juvenal where you would think we wouldn't because of the smut and the filth, but we do. And then other things which, you know, it just, it just kills me that we don't have the Ethiopist, the epic poem that told the story of, of Memnon and of Penthesilea that came after the Iliad, but we've only got fragments. So yay, we have the Iliad, but oh, we don't have the Ethiopist. And that's what it is being a classicist. It's, it's a sort of a slightly melancholy refrain that goes through your mind all the time. Of, you know, this is what we've lost. This is, the, this is what we've lost the whole time. Alongside with wanting to really show people what we've got. Absolutely. And the thing is that often, um, with stories that we have, you know, if we only have them in sources which aren't immediately easily readable, then the stories get lost, but they're still there. We still know that they exist. So um, when I wrote a chapter in A Thousand Ships on uh, Penthesilea, on the Amazon warrior, um, there were and are sources which I could use. Um, now, they're not particularly frequently read, the work of Pseudo Apollodorus and his Bibliotheca is a common text. And there are fragments from the Ethiopist which survive. But in order to get them, you have to buy, uh, you know, a, a book which has got little tiny fragments of Greek, you know, and little tiny translations. And it's, it's pretty, it's, it's not a, you know, fun bedtime read. Um, I'm lying. It's all the fun. <laughs> um, but, you know, not the story is there. And so you can find it and you can tell that story, but it means that in lots of ways, for me personally, professionally, 
it's it's a wonderful thing that I get to you know dig around, track down these stories, and then present them to people and say, look, this was here all along. And people are like, did you make that? No, I didn't make it up. I just dug around until I found it. So sometimes the stories, even the things which are lost, get found. You know, there's um, uh, there's a there's not we don't know very much about Jocasta, who is the um spoiler, uh, both mother and wife of Oedipus. Uh, but um, we have the story that people know, of course, is the Sophocles play, Oedipus the King, Oedipus Tyrannus in uh, Greek. Um, and she has very little say in that. She has uh, 120 lines. Um, so she's less than 10% of the whole. Although obviously she's, she's half the tragedy, you know, it's, it happens to her too. Um, and then there's, there's a much more nuanced version of her character perhaps a much more detailed version of her character in a Euripides play which does survive but is very rarely performed uh, the pointer side Phoenician women um, and so that was right there kind of hi hiding in plain sight people just don't perform it very often so the fact that her story a different version of her story is right there just got forgotten and then for maximum you know across the spectrum of whether we can find things out or not um, there was a poet called Stesichorus uh, who wrote um, some you know longish lyric poem, I think lyric, um, from you know including Jocasta's story in it, or at least part of her story, and we didn't think we had anything of it, and we didn't have anything of it. And a bit over a century ago, two French Egyptologists were, as people did at the time, rootling around Egypt, lifting stuff and you know taking it back to their home country. We of course were doing the exact same thing with people like Howard Carter. Um, but we weren't the only people who were um, who were looting another continent for, for antiquities. Um, and these Egyptologists took home a mummy because that's what Egyptologists, they're, they're just mad for mummy. <laughs> um, so they took home their mummy and they took it to the um, newly built, well, I think it's the Institute of Egyptology in Lille in France. And it sat there, um, packed. it's packed with a cartonnage, so um, like scrunched up papyrus to keep the mummy safe. And because Egyptologists are completely brilliant in every regard, but they really only care about Egyptology, nobody noticed for 70 years that the cartonnage had writing on it that was in Greek. And that turned out to be 70 lines, about 70 lines of Jocasta by, by the poet Stesichorus. And it was sitting there in plain sight, <laughs> packed around a mummy that everyone was interested in and focused on and they just didn't notice. So that seems to me like the perfect illustration of who Jocasta is. She is hiding in plain sight in, in, a, in a museum of antiquities where she's supposed to be and yet still nobody was paying attention to her. That right there tells you why you have to write books about these women, if you're me anyway. <laughs> but it, it's a, a similar idea that you're saying about the poet the, the scribes and the monks that they mm. they really recorded what they wanted that sat with their interests you know since the sort of 1400s and the kind of you know reconnection with the ancient world have we been really affected by the victorian moralities or different moralities of the time in terms of they the way they handed the classics on to us how what i state? mean definitely in some ways it's not my classical reception is not my specialist area i should tell you uh, not at all um, but you can certainly see in things at the most basic level in things like translation, um, you can see that translations tend to reflect the mores of their time as much as, if not more than, they reflect the mores of the time in which the poem or prose was written. And so the best illustration really is Emily Wilson's new translation of the Odyssey. Um, and she um, went through the book with, I mean, she's incredibly academically scrupulous, quite aside from being an excellent translator and poet in her own right. Um, she went through and looked at moments where, for example, um, Odysseus and his son Telemachus, uh, when, they, when Odysseus finally returns to Ithaca, uh, the poem is obviously a 24 book epic in which Odysseus, the long lost hero of the Trojan War, returns home and it's, it's taken him 10 years to do it. He's away for 10 years for the war, uh, Trojan War, and then 10 years of getting home, having adventures, etc., blinding a cyclops, um, <laughs> getting distracted by some ladies, and so on and so on. And when he eventually gets home, he and his son Telemachus um, slaughter the suitors. It's more than 100 men uh, who've been trying to persuade his wife to marry them in his absence, assuming he's dead. And Telemachus, at his behest, hangs 12 slave women who 
they believe have conspired with these super state. You can, of course, argue, as Wilson does very articulately and, in my view, accurately in the introduction of her translation, uh, that they have, you know, they're slaves. They don't have any say in the matter. So, you know, it's, it's pretty rich to accuse them of, of conspiracy when they have no freedom of, of agency because, you know, they're their own. But um, Telemachus hangs them uh, notoriously from single length of rope, all 12 women. And in countless translations that I, I, mean, I own, I don't know, something like four different translations of the Odyssey. I have no idea why, because when I need them, I either go to Emily's, which is only a couple of years old, or I just read the Greek. But anyway, I still find them very hard to get rid of. You're like, oh no, but what if I need my EV rear? <laughs> what if you never do? Oh yes, that's right. Um, but when you, when you look at them, the, there are countless translations. And when I reviewed the, the Wilson translation, um, I looked at ones from the 1900s and the 20th century, and over and over again, you found that the Greek, the Greek word is the female article, so the female word for the, and female and plural word for the in Greek, and then the word slave. So all it says is the female slaves. And yet over and over again, these translators had put sluts or husses as though they were somehow responsible for their own death, or at least that they'd done something so bad that they kind of deserved it. It's just not in the Greek. So, you know, I saw someone sent me a review of, uh, of the Odyssey translation when it came out because I had reviewed it um, as most people did with enormous uh, enthusiasm. Um, and they sent me a review saying, you know, how dare she kind of correct, correct Homer. But it's like, she hasn't, all she's done is take away other people's prejudice. She hasn't, you know, of course, every translation reflects the time of the translator. Um, as well as the time in which the work is written, but to to take out the the prejudice of the 1900s or or 1800s is not an act of revisionism. It, it's just an act of stripping away a different a different prejudice. Of course, thanks, Matt. That's incredible, and it you know really brings us on to your um, a thousand ships. The reasons why you chose to write this now. You know, since yes. I spoke to you um, at Salon, the book has been long listed for the Women's Prize for Yay. Fiction. Congratulations. <laughs> How did that feel? It felt amazing. Yeah, yeah. it felt completely amazing. Oh. Yeah, it's one of the nicest things that's ever happened, honestly, to me anyway. Yeah, it was really, really brilliant. It's hard being an author. You send your book out like a ship and you never know yeah. what's going to happen to it. And That's I don't think... the poet Marshall, the Roman poet Marshall, properly says, to, he writes these little tiny epigrams, and one of them is like, set sail, little book, good luck, <laughs> and that is how it feels. You're like, go on, little fella, go off, you'll be okay. <laughs> Mind the stormy seas. Yeah, it's like watching a child go to kindergarten or something. I'm like, take care, but you have to just send it on its way. So, yeah, when people find it and like it, it's of course, it's what you long to happen but you have no control over it at that point so it's, yeah. I don't think people really know how hard that is for authors and uh yes congratulations on your prize uh, and prize long list so so tell us how did this idea come about for you that you wanted to retell the Trojan War from a different perspective oh I'd wanted to um tell the story of the Trojan War for a while I think I told I'd written two novels which were basically Greek tragedies, one which is set in the modern world, Amber Fury, but it, it essentially follows the structure of the Orisbea, the Aeschylus plays. Um, it's more fun than I just made it sound. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then I'd done my version of the Theban story uh, called The Children of Jocasta. Um, and so I wanted to do the Trojan War and I knew that that was going to be an epic story rather than tragic story. You know, I'd kept, I kept my cast list really small. You know, that's the difference. Aeschylus calls tragedy slices from the banquet of Homer. Um, so you know that they're just quite sort of small. You know, there are only three actors, two actors in Aeschylus, three actors by the time we get to Sophocles and Euripides. Um, so there's never very many characters on stage at any given time. And that actually makes the, it, it really focuses your mind when you're trying to write. That if you're if you're trying to retell a tragedy, even in a novel form, there are more than you know there are scenes with six characters in an amber, for example. But I tried to keep the cast small because I wanted it to have that kind of claustrophobic feel, like a tragedy, and that's even even more so in uh, in the Children of Jocasta, where the set gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, but 
A Thousand Ships was really meant to be my epic. You know, I wanted to tell the story of the Trojan War from all the women's lives. I wanted to show what it was like being the women of Troy stuck in the city and then after the city falls, spoiler, um, <laughs> you know, with the lives that they're going to have. Because, of course, in the ancient world, if your city is taken, then the men are killed and the women are enslaved. Um, and they're taken away from their homeland. So they lose their language, they lose their name sometimes, you know, they lose everyone they know. It's it's a complete erasure, obliteration of your past. Um, and I wanted to tell the Trojan women's stories, but I, I didn't want it to just be theirs. I wanted to tell the story of the Greek women who were waiting for their husbands to come home. Sometimes they're waiting in a very long suffering way, like Penelope who has to wait for 20 years for Odysseus to come home. But sometimes it's in a much more, Mm, murderous way let's say in the case of Clytemnestra sometimes the the Greek women are waiting for husbands who won't ever come home you know who die in the battle as well so I wanted those and then also at the same time as running the kind of Greek story and the Trojan story I wanted to look at the causation of the war so I wanted to show the kind of terrible consequences of the war and just at that point it seemed like it was going to be quite epic <laughs> and then I thought I really also want to have a, a timeline that runs backwards but at this point, I should say my publishers were super patient. You know, you're like, I'm going to have multiple perspectives and voices and the timeline's going to run forwards and backwards. That's fine, right? And they were like, uh-huh, yes, say yes, by all means, go ahead. <laughs> and, you know, at that point, they could legitimately have cried and they did not. And so I wanted a causation timeline because if you look at, at the responsibility for the war, it's goddesses all the way. <laughs> They're so guilty. Goddesses. Um, goddesses. Go. It's goddesses. Yeah. It is goddesses, always goddesses. Um, and so I wanted to show that that side of it too. So um, the goddesses are, are kind of, we're going backwards. It's like, well, who who's sort of made this fall apart at the last minute? Who caused the war? Who did this? Who did this? Who did this? Why did they do that? Who did this? And then the story, so there were goddesses and mortals, Greeks and Trojans. And I wanted to, I wanted to take the whole story in as many directions as I could while, while maintaining a sort of a sense of, of narrative whole, which was really difficult. There were things I had to kind of jettison. I wanted to tell the Odyssey story um, in my book is entirely told from Penelope's perspective. And I really wanted to be able to tell it from all the women in the, I mean, there are so many female monsters in the Odyssey and goddesses, there's Circe, there's Calypso, there's Scylla, there's Charybdis. And I was like, how do you intend to do the story told by a whirlpool? Like, nah. And I thought about it for a while and I was like, I'm going to have to let, I, once I'd written a couple of Penelope, I, I think just one Penelope chapter, I thought, oh, her voice is so much fun. I'm just going to tell it all from, I didn't want to have to miss out the stories where there were no women, like the, the Cyclops story. Um, because it was so cool and I, I liked her so much I thought oh no I'll just I'll just let her tell it so sometimes there were there were female characters who didn't get as much page time as I would like them to have done I could easily have written this novel with a completely different set of female voices and you would have ended up with a different but but not vastly dissimilar book I think but yeah I try not to to dwell too much on the what could have been but occasionally I think oh there's another there's another version of this book, not a sequel, but another version where it's, you know, entirely told by the voice of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie Haynes, you wrote an epic. Mm, I really tried to. It used to be the case. I remember a few years ago, I guess it could be more than a couple now, um, someone saying that, you know, men got to write kind of epic books and women had to write domestic books. And that's what publishers would publish. And I think that was probably true then. And I think it's probably less true now, which is just wonderful because you know it, women are part of war we might not wish it to be true but it is true um their lives are impacted in exactly the same way and when i look at you know people often ask about the sort of inspirational texts for this book um and you know of course it's homer of course it's euripides but there are also other things i remember um a really long time ago now i guess maybe 2009 um, when the BBC could still afford to send us to review the Cannes Film Festival. I used to do a lot of reviewing for the BBC in those days. Um, and I, I watched an incredibly upsetting and necessary documentary about Rwanda, um, which talked about retributive justice. And it was a really interesting and especially sad um, film to watch because it kind of, it sort of presented, um, you know, it's like, well, we can't have 
we can't have re retribution, so we need to have restoration. Essentially, we're going to have restorative justice. So at, at a certain level, after a civil war, people have to just kind of agree to let bygones be bygones and, you know, move forward, because otherwise you'll never be able to, to do that. Your whole society will just be ridden forever. In fact, well, that's obviously true, and I completely agree with it. And yet, seeing these women being interviewed who had had violence done to them that I have no intention of um, further describing, they didn't seem like they had forgiven and forgotten the past. And I thought, yeah, it's interesting how as a society, it's right, I believe it absolutely and utterly, it is right that we say, okay, however awful these things are that happen to you, you have to move on. Um, but for that, that individual actual person, that's not always an option. I would go so far as to suggest it might not even ever be an option. And I kind of wanted to say, you know, it's it's not, it's these stories don't just disappear because we don't tell them. They don't just disappear because we don't hear them. They're still there. And you know this because you were you were there when we did it, but a few weeks ago we did an all-day performance, an all-day reading of a thousand ships at the British Museum, which of course um hosts people from literally all around the world. Um every day, uh, it is temporarily closed. Um, and a woman came up to me afterwards to say that she she was a refugee. She, she was a refugee and she was in London and she was crying and she thanked me for having given her story words. And I was crying because who wouldn't be crying at that point? And she was crying because she really earned it. And it, it's that thing where you go, you know, I'm not, I'm, I didn't set out to write about modern war but, but war is war. And so I wrote a story which I hoped was, you know, emotionally true and real. And some of it is very sad and some of it is very funny, I hope. The goddesses are funny. The, the human women have a much harder time of things, but the goddesses are completely untouched by things emotionally. So that gives them a complete kind of, yeah, whatever vibe that we never really get to see female characters have, I think. And so I hope it is, you know, like like people are. I hope it has that kind of emotional variety and complexity that we have. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a strange and very moving experience to see it read by other people, to see other people respond to it was really incredible. Yeah, I think, you know, when you when I read about read it the the first time, it was so striking that the stories that we grow up with are so. Um, saturated in the idea of when battles are over, the story ends. Um, yeah, the war's finished. The war yeah. is finished. It is, you know, the victor ha has won. The story is finished, and that's it. The the story ends. And mm -hmm. in your Trojan Women, you just give that sense of that's just the beginning for the yeah. biggest stories of their lives. Um, no, that's absolutely it, isn't it? It's a real problem, I think that. Um, that you're, you're right we sort of think a war is we still treat it there's a moment where the news kind of says this isn't like a sporting bout you know you don't get to you know because there are the the iliad i might add has a whole book of funeral games as indeed does the aeneid um where uh, where where men compete in sort of races and um and wrestling bouts and things to celebrate the life of a of a dead comrade and it it there's definitely a sense that you can you can look at a war like that, but of course it's not. Of course it's not. It doesn't, you know, there's, there's, there's not a nice set of rules that people ever abide by. Um, and the, there aren't bystanders. There are just different levels of people drawn into it. So, yeah, we think of, you know, the great, the great warrior story, I suppose, in the Iliad is, is Achilles versus Hector. And we see what happens to Hector within that poem, but we don't see what happens to his widow and his son in that poem because um, Troy still stands at the end of the Iliad. Um, we have to go to the Euripides play, to the Trojan women, um, to see what happens. And it is horrifying, beyond horrifying. Um, and so yes, that sense that a story is finished when the war is over, you know, not even close. It never has been, I think, for the survivors of a war, you know, not everybody, is a winner when it's finished is that we we still tend to think i think in ancient war that you know the, the losers all die and the winners you know walk away with with no injuries and everything is just fine and of course you know it's not even close to true and it, the 
other thing that you do so beautifully in Thousand Ships is play around with the idea of what it is to be a, a hero. I think there's even yeah. a quote in it where you say um, heroism is something that can reside in us all, in all of us. Mm. And, you know, it was really refreshing to see in a book uh, um, that friendship and kindness could be heroic. Heroic. Yeah, of course. And sometimes they are the most heroic thing you can be because sometimes you don't have the capacity to be other things. At the very start of the tour, you know, I spent most of uh, about eight months last year on tour. Yeah. Um, and at the very beginning of it, literally the very first date of it, um, before the book was even out, the weekend before it came out, I spoke at a school in Manchester um, because my friend Matthew had asked me if I would. And I asked these kids, because obviously I hadn't written the talk, I was still writing it on the way there, you already know this is true. Um, and uh, I asked these kids what they thought it meant to be a hero, because I wanted to talk about Penthesilea being a hero. And I thought there are reasons why you know, maybe people will think we don't think of her in the same, in the same breath. Although the, the Greeks certainly did. being the woman warrior. Penthesilea, the Amazon warrior queen. Yeah. And um, if we read Pseudo Apollodorus, he has loads of detail about how she's like a wild animal. She's like a lion. She's exactly the same descriptive language that he uses for Achilles. He uses for Penthesilea. So for him, at least, and other ancient authors, she is for certain sure a hero in exactly the same way that male heroes are. And I wanted to ask these boys um, why they thought, you know, what, what made a hero? And we talked it through and we were like, okay, well, is it having a, a god for a parent? Because loads of heroes like Achilles has Thetis, the scene, but, but Hector, who's the great hero of the Trojans, doesn't have a god for a parent. And even within the Iliad, the goddess Hera is like, well, why do you care about him? He doesn't even have a god for a parent. Um, but nobody's pretending he's not a hero. She just doesn't think he's a really good one because he's, he's only got mortal parents. But it's like, okay, so that's not a good enough reason to be and it's like, well, do you have to be good at fighting? No, Menelaus is rotten at fighting. Paris is even worse. <laughs> you have to be this. You have to. Be... And in the end, one of these um, boys said, maybe that you're a hero if you can persuade other people to call you a hero. And uh, it's such a good answer because the hom Homeric code of being a hero is all about yourself. It's very individualistic. It's about kudos, uh, which in Greek means, um, yeah, honor, I suppose, or good things that accrue to you. And it's about your chaos, your um, fame, which extends beyond your death. It's, it's a way of being immortal um, because for the Greeks, there isn't, you know, the idea of life after death and things like that just doesn't exist, um, at least not at that stage. Um, and so it's a question of having immortality. Being sung about by bards means that you're immortal, which means that your chaos is really valuable. So that's what it means to be a hero. And it's like, you know, that's a really good answer. If other people think you're a hero and therefore your story is told as a heroic narrative, that's as good an answer as any I'm going to get. And I'm, you know, eight months later, I was like, no, that's still the best answer I heard. So I should have got this boy's name because I have quoted him lots of times. But I suppose it would be probably a safeguarding issue or something. But anyway, this very brilliant boy in Manchester said this very brilliant thing and I have stolen it and passed it off as my own. Well, that's your reward for going out and doing so many schools and state schools talks and really, you know, living by your creed of getting, you know, classics to wherever you can get it to. And I know you do it. Um, no, I we're gonna go to questions in a bit, but I just got to ask about writing the goddesses. You do yes. write in the voice of um, three goddesses in in the book. How do you do that? How do you approach writing as goddesses? No. Oh, um, the trick is you read Euripides in Euripides' play Hippolytus, which is not about the Trojan War, uh, but is instead about a young man named Hippolytus who is the son of Theseus of Minotaur killing fame and the stepson of Phaedra. Uh, who you may know from Racine's play Phaedra, recently-ish performed with Helen Mirren uh, at the National Theatre. And when I say recently, I mean probably 10 years ago, something like that. Um, and I think maybe Dominic Cooper played Hippolytus, but anyway. And um, in that play, the goddess Aphrodite walks on stage at the beginning and she says, I hate Hippolytus because he doesn't show me any honour. He's always hanging out with Artemis and he doesn't have sex with anyone, basically. He doesn't have sex with boys or girls and I don't like him. And he's rude, so I'm going to destroy him. And I, I'm going to destroy his stepmother and I'm going to just, and his dad is going to kill him um, using the curses that he was given by the god Poseidon. And I've basically set all this in motion over the last couple of years. And today is the day it's all going to come to fruition. And you go, wait, what now? And, you know, she's so petty. She's a goddess. She's so petty. It's like some guy, you start off by saying, oh, I honor people who honor me. And then you literally tell us a few lines later that because this boy has upset you, you're going to destroy his stepmother, who 
has set up an actual literal temple to you. But too bad she's collateral damage. She doesn't give her a breath of thought. And then at the end, we could think to ourselves, oh, well, Aphrodite's just kind of a bit. But then at the end of the play, Artemis, um, whose favorite Hippolytus has been destroyed by Aphrodite's scheme, comes on stage and she says, this was all Aphrodite's fault. And now she's destroyed one of my favorites, I'm gonna kill one of hers. And she goes off to do it and it's like, I, no one has hugged and no one has learned. It's like an episode of Seinfeld, but no one's hugged and no one's learned. So that's what I did. I read my Euripides and I thought that's the goddesses that I want to write. I should say that in um, fifth century Athens, Euripides um, was criticized by his contemporaries for his attitude to the gods, which was seen as being very disrespectful. And he may even have been, or probably was, prosecuted for impiety. Uh, Asabea is the word in Greek for blasphemy. Um, and this kind of thing is why, because his idea of the gods and goddesses is so petulant and like a toddler, but they are, it's enormously empowering to write these characters who just don't care, who have absolutely no concern about social mores and no concern about other people's feelings. And writing women who are like that, it's just, it's so, you're like, oh my God, I never get to do this. <laughs> so yeah, it was a, they were incredibly good fun to do. And even my nice goddesses, like Calliope is a nice one. Um, even she is like, whatever. Um, and the ones who are actively appalling, like Eris, Strife, the goddess of Strife, um, she is a total monster, um, literally and metaphorically, she's got wings and claws and everything. Um, and, and so I, I kind of thought, well, you know, what would be more fun to write here than a sort of terrifying vengeance goddess would be one who's just a little bit stupid. And so she causes this kind of chaos everywhere she goes. She never quite remembers how or why. She always thinks vaguely that there must be someone else. And writing somebody who is just really malevolent, but a bit thick. Oh my God, it was so much fun. It was, I, I never write stupid characters. I always write kind of brainy, interesting kind of emo characters. I thought, oh no, this is so much fun. <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna do this. <laughs> so yeah, I would happily write a whole novel from Eris's perspective. I, I adore her. I just adore her. <laughs> it's in a very funny part of the book as well. Thank um, you. Paris is so hapless, isn't he? Yes, he is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I want to ask a, a couple of questions because people have been um, texting in, Nat. Cool. Okay, I've got a question from Sandra, which is nice, wants to kick us off. And she says, why does Natalie think that these classical stories are so endearingly popular? Oh, endearing or enduring? Well, both to me. Endearingly, um, yeah. Yeah, I think the, um, their, well, obviously their endurance speaks for itself because here we are, you know, 3,000 plus years after the Trojan War, if it happened, happened, and we're still telling those stories. Um, why are they endearing? Um, I think probably because they are archetypal in so many ways. You know, the story, there's a, there, even the ones which are difficult for us tell us things about ourselves that I think um, we, pos I mean, there's a reason why Freud turned to Greek myth, for example, um, in order to uh, work out what he thought about all kinds of, um, of psychological conditions. There's a reason why there's an Oedipus complex and not an Odin complex or something. He turned to Greek myth rather than Norse myth because it's much more psychologically nuanced, I would suggest. Um, and I think the fact that we see ourselves reflected back um, in the Greeks, it, that is what endears us to them, them to us, um, is that sense that although, um, as the as a Latinist would say, although mutatis mutandis, with all the things that must be changed having been changed, um, although obviously we're very different in lots of ways, our societies are completely different um, in lots of ways from ancient societies, um, human beings aren't that different. You know, Thucydides, uh, who famously survived the Great Plague in the fifth century and then went on to write his history of the Peloponnesian War with terrible survivors, but, um, Thucydides described his history as a kiterma, uh, a, a possession for all time. He said, human nature being what it is, um, people will change, but they won't, you know, they won't really change. That this will still be, this history that I'm writing about fifth century Athens will be important for all time because people will always be essentially people. And I think that's, that's really true. And the Greeks particularly, you know, I love Roman history and and Roman literature, and I spend less of my time now concentrating on that because I spend so much time concentrating on the Greeks, but I, I still love you, I still love you Romans. Um, but that sense that we're, that we're seeing a society which questions itself 
so much it's uh, you know which asks questions that are so important to us now what does it mean in the fifth century you know philosophy changes forever before that point it had basically been what we would call natural science it was asking what the universe was made of you know was is it made of one element or two do we come from this or this and then suddenly socrates plato aristotle in the fifth and then fourth century bce come along and they ask questions like what does it mean to be good what's beauty what is justice and these are questions which which we still need answers to you know they haven't they haven't gone anywhere if we want to be happy there are many worse things we could do with ourselves than read aristotle's nicomachean ethics if it's too um boring and difficult because they are lecture notes i would recommend either edith hall's marvelous book aristotle's way or um, for free you can uh listen to her talking about aristotle um on uh natalie haynes comes up to the classics series five i knew that series five which is on bbc sounds at the moment so you know and that that will give us you know these these writers were writing for posterity they wanted to be um read and thought about you know millennia in the future and so i think um that that desire to reach us you can read back that's why you have those incredible roman tombstones which say basically you know stop traveler and look at this and see that this person is buried they want us to be thinking of them now they're reaching from the past to us i, I can't see what more fun you could have than reaching back but there it is. that's beautiful and also Thanks. a really good chance to say you know you have done five series of natalie haynes stands up for the classics for yeah. um, bbc radio 4 and they yeah. are now on um, bbc sounds you they know are all 20 episodes on yeah. bbc sounds so please do download it's a great listen, chance to start yeah yes. yeah a really good chance to start to get to grips with um the classics and to begin to understand the scaffolding scaffolding to our civilization i hope so yeah okay i've got a a uh, question from Hattie. I know Hattie. Hello, Hattie. <laughs> She's been to Salon many times. Um, and she says, Natalie, she went to a girl's, girl's school where they didn't get taught Latin, or they, they did in the boys' school. Oh. Uh, uh -huh. So like consequently... I wasn't already crossed. <laughs> Sorry. We've done so well. Right. Um, so she's consequently always thought of Latin as a gendered male subject yeah of course why wouldn't you yeah. why wouldn't you um however she says it seems there's been a real flowering of um classically inflected mm -hmm. fiction by women writers in the last few years and she wanted to know if you thought there is a classical bent to classical a masculine bent to classical literature or is it just the way it's been traditionally translated oh well there definitely is insofar as virtually every single writer that we have from the ancient world was male um, and also even more elite than that was was mostly posh and male because those are the people who could afford to be educated so you could write and those are the people who could um, afford to take the time to write um, everybody else was earning a living uh, so you know um, it's it's assuredly true that the um, there is a huge gender imbalance in ancient writers for every Sappho there are literally dozens and dozens of male writers um, whose work survives to us in greater quantities. Sappho wrote nine books of lyric poetry. We have three poems and the rest are all fun. So, um, of course that's the case, but I guess I would argue that um, that doesn't necessarily mean that just, just because men are writing these things doesn't mean that there's nothing there for women, for me anyway, there, there, there's everything there. You know, Euripides wrote the in his monologue at the start of uh, Medea, and remember, this is written by a man. It was first performed in 431 BCE. Um, and the role of Medea, like all female roles in uh, Greek theatre, would have been played by a man. Remember, they're wearing masks in uh, Greek theatre. And the audience at the Dionysia, the dramatic festival where it first performed, might very well have just been also men. Um, and there may not have been women able to see it until you know, later in its, its performing life when it's basically being shown in rep uh, later on. Um, and this speech where Medea says it's terrible it's the most incredible speech and I talk about it I think in some detail in the Euripides version of Stand Up for Classics so you can download that if you want um but she says it's awful being uh, a woman because you get married to a man and you don't know anything about him you have to buy him dowry and uh he might be a 
a terrible man and you won't find out until afterwards there isn't a mark she says you can see there's like a mark that shows you that it's real gold from counterfeit but there isn't that on a man which where is where we could need it and she says you know if, if a man gets bored at home he can go out and and fool around basically but we're just stuck here and this speech was so extraordinary that it was still being read at suffrage meetings uh, just over a hundred years ago this speech by a man performed by a man about the condition of women being performed to men whose wives were all cloistered at home not able to come and see this and it is still a revolutionary piece of writing Euripides is a revolutionary feminist writer in my reading of him um you know millennia before his time so of course it's true that you should and want to read female writers and I'm right there with you but they have these men have something to say eh? I've told you this before we've discussed this before when we've been talking about going to see a film or something um and I'm like you know I'm I'm kind of good now to see stories about men doing man stuff if it's as good as Sophocles Ajax or Sophocles Philoctetes a, a play with absolutely no women in at all then I'm definitely keen to see it but do you know how many of those there are not that many so just men wanging on about being men I'm probably good for that for a bit um but Euripides is not that guy oh, well done Euripides <laughs> um so we've got a couple of questions um that are, are really about women warriors and we i know we've Ooh. already spoken about um penthesilea mm -hmm. the amazonian warrior queen yes who is uh one of the voices in your women's prize long-listed book <laughs> so <Never get> uh, <laughs> so um we've got someone who's uh texting from the the states and he said um he's references a recent bbc article you can you contributed to saying um the author's reclaiming of the forgotten voices of women he was wondering out a particular idea that new dna testing had revealed that uh, about one third mm. of the warriors found in mass graves were in fact women he wanted not to know in all a little mass bit graves but in some mass graves yeah he, for sure he yeah. wanted to know a little bit more about that yeah what he needs to do is read adrian mayer's adrienne e double n e adrienne mayer's excellent book amazon's ancient and modern um which is uh just the most incredible and very scholarly um, and detailed analysis of uh of amazon's ancient and modern um and she makes a really good case um for the idea that the the greeks have this idea of amazon's as sort of um as barbarian and exotic and strange so you get um these fighting scenes which are called amazonomikis a battle between greek men and amazon women and the they are presented as opposites so the greek men are you know dressed in very sensible greek tunics these women these foreign women are wearing highly decorated leggings which are trousers which no man would wear and so on and so they're very very strange and exotic um, and these women behave like men. There's a, a bit in Pausanias in his description of Greece where he can see a, a sculpture which we can no longer see, it's lost. And he counts very carefully the number of, of warriors on each side. There are 29 Greek men fighting 29 Amazon women. So it's, it's, an, even, it's an even battle, it's evenly pitched. Um, and uh, Adrian Mayer makes a very good case for the fact that um, this, this mythical notion of Amazons, these, these mythic women, have probably got real world parallels um and the the warrior women of and, and nomadic women of the steppe the russian steppe um it seems to be a, a good place to start because there's a huge history of women therefore not of uh, being nomadic which it seems like the the amazons were based at a place called themiscara um but they rode horses very eagerly there's no sense of them having a particularly grand city at themiscara um and uh and so these Scythian women seem like a good model for perhaps, you know, the, did the Greeks see the odd one? Is that where the kind of idea of Amazon came from? Maybe. Um, but in some of those warrior graves found on the, in the steppe, um, yeah, up to a third of the bodies are female. So not, not all of mass graves, but up to a third um, in some of these um, Scythian or, or that kind of area warrior graves. And we've only been able to, yeah, I say we, I clearly can't do it, um, but scientists have only been able to test the DNA of skeletons for sex the sex of the person who died so relatively recently this is a pretty recent archaeological advance and up to this point we had always i think assumed or people had often assumed that um 
if you found a, a bones with with weapons that must be a man and if you found bones with jewelry that must be a woman but actually of course often men were um oh have i lost have i lost the speaker i think maybe i have let's just switch no. over because i have lost so. no it's all fine it's all fine yeah let me just check so if i can yeah, we yeah. can still hear you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm putting up Natalie's book. <laughs> Can you hear me? Natalie, we were talking about the DNA findings. No. Okay. The AirPods were working. The AirPods were working. No, still no. Still not working. Okay. Natalie, I think we're going to have to bring it to a close. Is that right, Dickon? Okay. Um, thank you so much, Natalie Haynes. Congratulations on your Women's Prize nominated, long-listed book, A Thousand Ships. Um, thank you so much for um, being part of our um, Salon Live streaming. Um, it's been such a pleasure to talk to Natalie Haynes about the classics. I really hope that you're convinced that now might be a time to really find out more about this incredible world and what a fascinating... Uh, person she is to hear from about her subject she loves so much and which she's worked so hard to bring to us uh, oh, we're going to be thank you <laughs> thank you Nat I'm sorry for my slight um, microphone fail but I'm back if you need me for another question um, we I think just to finish off because we're absolutely um, out of town time it's just if you could tell us very quickly uh, about your work in progress, which you've finished oh. today. Um, oh, I, haven't, I haven't finished it today. Don't tell my editor. I still, <laughs> I still need tomorrow to write the uh, conclusion. I'm sorry. Um, I've done the editing. I haven't finished. Um, it's not finished. Um, but yeah, no, it's called Pandora's Jar. And uh, it is a non-fiction book about women in Greek myth. And so it's basically 10 women um, who you might see in my novels, um, Helen, for example, uh, your lovely namesake, um, Clytemnestra, but also some women that I have uh, written, uh, Eurydice, um, uh, the wife of Orpheus, who I wrote a, a short story for Radio 4 about. I'm not sure if you can download that or not, but if you can, I think it's called Letter from Eurydice. And some women I've never written about before, uh, Phaedra, for example. Uh, Medea, who I wrote my dissertation on as an undergraduate, but um, that's, you know, as it is. Um, you, you're going to have to hear things ping now, because unfortunately <laughs> I've taken my earphones out, so now pingage will occur. I can't turn it off because then you won't be able to hear it anyway. Um, so, though, but that's nice for the people who are at home watching and uh, texting in. You can hear yourselves. Don't all do that. I'll be back with you in two minutes. Um, so it's basically 10 essays, I suppose, on these women and a conclusion, which is going to be amazing, um, which tells us uh, a little bit about their stories in the ancient world and then how they distort through time. So Pandora is a case in point. She does not, I can con exclusively reveal on your salon stream, she does not have a box in the ancient world. Pandora, Pandora doesn't have a box. She doesn't have a box. It's just, it's a vicious lie made up by Erasmus. I'm absolutely not joking. <laughs> And that's that Erasmus. <laughs> okay, and um, so we will see that in October and see you October 1st. October yeah. 1st. And we'll see you on the Salon London stage at the end of September with Pandora's yep. Jar. And we, we will. will see you on the road um, with your next book. Yeah, Thank and you you'll so see much. Me also, whether you like it or not. So. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. I love you, Helen Mouse. <laughs> and you. Good night. Bye, Salon Easters. <laughs> Good night. Thank you so much for joining us for a Salon live stream. It's been such a pleasure to talk to Natalie Hayes. We will be doing some uh, Salon London live streams over the next few weeks. So do let us know what you'd like to find out about and what you'd like us to do. It'd be great to hear from you. And thank you so much to our Salon members um, for staying with us. Lots of love. This Salon is now closed. <laughs>